Shall we stand when we begin our midweek prayer service? We're thankful that the Lord has allowed us to meet in another service tonight. We're going to ask Brother Chris to open our service in a word of prayer. Brother Chris. Yes. Yes. As we come in together, we're thankful for that. Good to see Amen. each and every one. We're thankful for our pastor is here tonight. Yes. As he was entering into the service, we ask that you would bless him in a very yes, special way. Lord. Remember those that are yet on their way, dear God. Be in everything that is said and done that we might draw closer to you and closer to one another. Amen. 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 Let's uh, remain standing. Turn to page 81 in our evening lights. Even 81.
may be seated. Let's turn to page 126. Page 126. 26. That we are blessed of all people in the state of Oregon, right? To be free from sin. Most religions teach you that you can't be free from sin. But thank God we're free from sin. Isn't that a blessing? That is such a blessing. I want you to know that you're very precious. Every one of you is very, very precious to the pastor and his wife. All right, William, 126. All right. Before prayer, let's turn to page 175. Sitting at the feet of Jesus.
we're thankful to be able to gather in church in the middle of the week to be able to come and bring our burdens to God that we may unburden ourselves. So I wonder, as we go to prayer, if anybody has a burden or a request they'd like to make known. Yes, Sister Sarah. Mm. Yes. Yes, Brother Brian. Yes, those are my brothers back here. Mm. Yes, let's remember him. Sister Ruth. Go ahead, Sister Ruth. <laughs> Brother Fisher. Mm. Yes. Sister Trina. Yes. One of his needs. Brother Chad. Brother Boyce. Yes. Brother Jerry. Remember our pastor had a couple rough days. Remember the speaker of the hour, unsaved loved ones. If there's none other, any unspoken prayer requests, by knuckle up your hand. If you're able to kneel, we'll ask you to kneel at this time. We're going to ask Brother Chad Ritchie to word our prayer. Brother Chad. Thank you for traveling with to go to thought this morning. We could easily be hit head on on the way to work or on the way home and God you brought us again another beautiful week brought us here safely that we could all come here to worship you Lord God we personally want to thank you for all that the wonderful blessings you showed upon us we thought this week Lord all these rich messages that we hear week after week after week and they help us and encourage us Lord and as we talk to those that we work with and those we're surrounded with of their struggles in life Lord and Yes, life is very difficult, but God, you are able to help them. And so, God, we just want to, each one of us, no doubt, have those around us that we just sometimes want to step out of our comfort zone and make them understand or have them understand how much you can do for them. And God, it just makes us recognize how blessed we really are to have the understanding that we have, to be able to have victory over many, many different devices in this world that seem to try to pull us down. And we appreciate all the strength you give us, the encouragement that we get from our pastor and our brother Reggie, as he brings these messages to encourage us, Lord, and we thought often about how we, we love to go to work and we love to go home, but we should have a deep desire and love to come to church, and God, we're so blessed. We uh, just want to raise these uh, requests up this evening, Lord, I purposely don't want to miss anybody, but just the mentions of their requests out of these people's mouths, Lord, you've heard them. We want to hear a request for Brother Fisher, and uh, I believe that his brother is going to be having this heart surgery. God, help us to remember these requests, not only tonight, but God, as we go out and we uh, find our prayer closet in the evening or in the morning, we want to continue to lift these ones up. And Brother Watson's request, I believe that I didn't hear it all, but you know what he stands in need of, this request for, I believe it was his sister or a family member he wants to speak to. And uh, Brother Holtry's request, I didn't hear it, but God, you saw that one as well. And then Brother Bernard, Lord, we've missed him. We thought about him. We want to continue to lift him up in prayer this evening. And then Sister Sarah's request, Lord, you know what that is, and Brother Jerry's request. God, we don't want to fail to miss anybody. Remember those that uh, we've been working with. Remember the leaders of our country, Lord. We're so blessed. We appreciate all that you do. 
Thank you for each one here, Lord, putting the effort out to come tonight. We ask you to be with our pastor in a very special way, Lord. Continue to help him, Lord. We can continue to pray for him, God, but only you can help. And so, God, we look to you. We know that you are a mighty God. You're in control of all things. And so, God, we pray you be with them in a very special way. Remember, Brother Reg, you're the speaker of the hour. Be with them as well. Again, Lord, we don't want to miss anybody on purpose, Lord. We want to continue to lift those up. And we've heard the request this evening, Lord. Again, we thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Our precious, loving Heavenly Father, we are so very thankful. Many scriptures come to our mind. The Bible says we should agree in prayer. And we do agree in prayer. There are many very strong, solid requests that are brought tonight for our saints here in this area and saints uh, back in Tennessee. And we agree, dear God, that you'll minister to each one of these needs. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And Father, we're thankful for the congregation. We love everyone. And God, we're thankful how you have helped us in marvelous, marvelous ways. The Bible says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. God bless the congregation, everyone. We know there are busy things. People can become extremely busy. But God bless each and every one. We pray, Father, those we're working with, we're thankful for our many new people. We're blessed with many new people that are coming and Father, we are so very, very grateful. Bless in the furthest of this meeting. We ask it in Jesus' name. And we pray you remember the congregation and remember our nation, dear God. We're living in a country that needs help so badly. God, remember our president and the, those, Father, who have a leading role. God, bless them, we pray. Bless the furtherance of this meeting, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.
Turn to page 246 in the evening light, 246. I'm sitting back here lots of times. I don't have a hymn, though I don't feel good, and so I don't sing. But I thought the court, you all sound so nice. The church singing sounds absolutely beautiful. Sometimes we have a huge number of people that listen to the church as they sing here in Canby. And lots of times I don't feel well enough to sing, but I listen, and it sounds absolutely beautiful. So I thank God for every one of you. Verse number two, Sister Lily. Perhaps to
Pray for the junior choir. They have a song for us tonight. The junior choir.
Thank you, children. Shall we stand? We'll hand the service over to Brother Reggie. Good job, Junior Choir. That was real good. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. Father, we need you tonight. We need you to help us. We ask you to go with us, remember our country in a special way, and as your pastor and the needs represented here especially and, and elsewhere too, I want to remember the congregation in Hamilton in a special way. Be with us now. Just go with us and help in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Turn with me, if you would, to the last book in the Old Testament, at least as it appears in our Bibles, Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. I want to look at the third chapter, just one verse, Malachi 3 and verse number 6, Malachi 3 and verse number 6, for I am the Lord... I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Here in our scripture text, we are introduced to yet another attribute of God. Several services ago, I began a series I've entitled The Characteristics of Our Creator. In Isaiah 44, 24, the prophet penned Isaiah 44, verse 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. God is our creator. And there are many wonderful characteristics about our creator. It goes on to say, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by, uh, by myself. God did all this. And one rendering says, this is what the Lord says, your redeemer and creator, I am the Lord who made all things, I alone Stretched out the heavens. Who was with me when I made the earth? Who is the Lord? Jeremiah 32, 27. Jeremiah 32, 27. We have these words. Behold, I am the Lord. Who is the Lord? The God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? So far in this series, we've been looking specifically at the omni-attributes of God. In our first lesson, the first installment in this series, we learned about God's omnipotence, which describes Him as all-powerful. And it's seen, easily viewed through the preservation of His creation and His rule and reign over all political powers. In our second lesson, we learned about God's omniscience, which describes Him as all-knowing. This truth works to counsel, comfort, cheer, encourage, and present us with curiosity or amazement about who he is and what he can do in our lives. In our third lesson, we learned about God's omnipresence, which describes him as present in all places at the same time. We found that since God, God's presence is inescapable, sin is inexcusable. I don't know about you, but I've been enjoying studying these series. This is not a series I've preached before. This is a new one for me. But I have found it exciting, encouraging, and invigorating to read about the greatness of our God. We can't exhaust His greatness. Certainly the Word of God gives us many scriptures, and it's encouraging, inspiring to read about just how great God is. I uh, don't like necessarily day-old pastries or donuts that have been sitting for a few days. Maybe some of you do. And uh, when I've studied for this series, I have found it just refreshing, something new. Even though the Word of God's been around for many years, and we've heard messages, I'm sure, along this line, there's just something about getting in God's Word and studying it for yourself. I have found uh, many opportunities to experience God's greatness, even these last few days. Uh, last week, I was just suffering horrendously from a back issue. Has anyone ever suffered in their back? And I don't know what I did for sure, but I was just all knotted up under my shoulder, just I could hardly move. And on Thursday of last week, it was the place where it was just kind of making me sick. And I told my students, I'm very transparent with them, and, and I said, now you're going to have to help Steg out today. I kind of said this effect. They said, I'm, I'm hurting. I said, but I'm here kind of thing. And 
So we did some sectionals, and I, I, I taught throughout the day. But I made a phone call. There's a chiropractor just down the street from the school. Never been there. But I made a call to him. I said, the office is very close. And thought, so I thought, well, I'd check it out and see if they take my insurance, which they did. And can you get me in today? Well, they could, but the time I don't think worked out. So I offered a time. And lo and behold, they could get me in. So I went over there after school on Thursday. And I checked in there and was doing some paperwork and seated there in the waiting room, just kind of, you know, in pain and just kind of sitting there meditating, whatever. Well, this, there was a lady in the waiting room over here, and she was kind of staring at me, and do you teach up here at the high school orchestra or whatever? I said, yes, and oh, and so, and so on and so forth. Here it was, a, stu a parent of a stu former student of mine who was married to the owner of the practice. So there I am in, uh, in that uh, shop. He got me in and just gave me a lot of wonderful treatment and access to different things. And when I went to leave, one of the things wasn't covered on my insurance. She said the doctor took care of it or he's competent or whatever. So I appreciate that. Uh, God put me in that position, I believe, and, and was looking out for me. And then uh, on Monday, I was doing some yard work, trying to get a few things done around the house. And I'm just speaking here about God's omniscience and his omnipresence and how that he works on our behalf. But I was doing some yard work and I have some boys who like to be around dad and do some yard work too. And they like to get the loppers and do other things and trim things. And well, I'm coming down the ladder. I look down and Urban's got a pair of my uh, pair of trimmers and uh, manual ones. and They've got a long blade on them. And he's shoving them in the dirt, kind of doing a little pokey pokey sort of thing with them. And he does a pokey pokey right into the top of his foot and shoves it right through his shoe into his foot. Well, it was just immediately uh, there was sense of danger and and uh, and it was an emergency sort of a, sort of a situation. I don't remember. It was so fast whether I pulled him out of his foot or he pulled him out of his foot. But if I gross anyone out, let me know. But anyways, I pulled off the shoe, and it was pretty significant. And so Boston, bless his heart, ran inside the house and got some ice and paper towel. He came flying out, and we got a hold of mom, and away we went. My insurance is not taken here in town at the uh, urgent care. We had to go all the way into Clackamas. But uh, it was a long ordeal. Anyone been to the emergency room before? Yeah. Well, so I had to go to, Pro to Kaiser because that's my insurance. So we were debating where, where should we go, but my insurance is only covered under Kaiser. It's Kaiser insurance. But anyways, there we were. It's, you know, it's an emergency, and we sat, and we sat, and we sat some more. And then about two hours, they put us into another room, and we sat for about another hour. And then they put us into what I would call the ER proper, and we sat some more. And here's a three-year-old with an open wound on his foot, and there we sit, and we sit, and we sit. And anyways, I won't give you all the details. It was a kind of a horrific situation, but uh, Jill uh, is friends with a doctor here in town, and she kind of nursed, she kind of indicated the way they offer or treated that was not right. But anyways, we thank God that Urban still has a foot. And I'm not sure the outcome of all of this, but uh, I'm thankful for God's mercy. It could have been much worse. They, they, of course, were concerned about the tendon there, and there's bones in your feet and so on. But I'm thankful that it wasn't much or any worse than it was. So we're serving a uh, omniscient God who's all-knowing. He's omnipresent. He's with us everywhere, and he's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. It's amazing how God can take a wound and bring that skin together and heal it, isn't it? Just absolutely incredible. Tonight, I would like for us to look at a fourth attribute of our great God. In our scripture text, we find the minor prophet Malachi expressing yet another attribute of God. He says here in Malachi 3 and 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Another rendering says, I am the Lord and I do not change. This is why you descendants of Jacob are not utter, uh, already destroyed. 
My message tonight deals with the fourth attribute of God, and I've entitled it God's Immutability. God's Immutability. In this ever-changing world where little stays the same, there is someone who's unceasingly constant that the Word of God does name. His character and commitment and covenant promises, too, are where this amazing attribute of God begins to come into view. Never is he moved by masses or swayed by popular opinion, for he watches over all the world from his supreme dominion, bringing to the Christian soul peace and tranquility. This characteristic of our creator is God's immutability. From about 1920 to 1960, or the 1920s to 1960s, most of you folks out there that lived back then used what we call a rotary phone. Anyone remember a rotary phone? Okay, just a couple of you out there, a few of you. Now that rotary phone was replaced by what we call a dial phone. Gradually began to replace that, push button phones. When dial phones are, uh, were gradually, sorry, when gr dial phones were gradually replaced by push button phones. 1973, we had what was called the first handheld cellular mobile device. 1973. 1992, IBM announced the very first smartphone. 1992. It could actually send and receive both emails and faxes. Isn't that something? Send an email and a fax via a smartphone. Now, that smartphone in 1992 would cost you about $899. In today's dollars, about $1,435, roughly. That's the stat I found anyways. 2007, we had the first what? iPhone. The first iPhone. It's really something you think about. it. Probably many of us have an iPhone right here in, in, the, in the congregation. That was, that's only been around since 2007. And not very long. But I was thinking about change and kind of our society. And you think about what a smartphone allows you to do as far as the things that are all brought into one device. When years ago, you'd have maybe a big computer and you'd have a phone and you'd have a fax machine. And the weather, newspaper, I don't know, call downtown Portland, what's the weather going to be? But you had to have all these different avenues and modes and devices. But how change affects so much of our life. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus, I believe is his name, one of the most significant Western thinkers to have lived before Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, is had this celebrated saying, the only thing constant is change. In making such a statement, Heraclides captured what many others have also recognized, namely, that there is precious little that is stable in the world around us. Such realities drive us to seek stability, whether it's in a relationship, our bank accounts, our surroundings, or something else. We seek stability. And moreover, we're eventually disappointed by such things, for everything in creation is subject to change. To find true stability and permanence, we must look beyond the created order to its creator. Our text denotes that there is someone who doesn't change. Immutable means unchanging over time or unable to be changed. Malachi penned, for I am the Lord. I change not. One rendering reads like this. God is a spirit whose being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth are infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. God's immutability defines all God's other attributes. God is immutably wise, immutably merciful, good, and gracious. Certainly his mercy can turn to wrath. But he's the merciful God. God is immutable in his omnipotence, all-powerful. His omnipresence, present everywhere. And his omniscience are all-knowing. The immutability of God, his quality of not changing, is clearly taught throughout the word of God. 
We find it clearly communicated in our scripture text tonight. Malachi 3 and verse number 6. In the New Testament, we find it in James 1 and verse number 17. James 1 and verse number 17. It says this. Every good gift. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Amen. The Amplified renders it in this manner. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights, the creator and sustainer of the heavens, in whom there is no variation, no rising, no or setting, or shadow cast by his turning, for he is perfect and never changes. The great principles of right and wrong never alter. Amen. They are as everlasting as he who gave them. God here speaks of himself by his covenant name, which expresses his eternal independent being. The father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The shadow of turning refers to our perspective on the sun. It is eclipsed. It moves and it casts its shadow. The sun rises and the sun sets, appears, disappears every day. It comes out of one tropic and enters into another at certain seasons of the year. But with God, who spiritually speaking is light itself, there is no darkness at all. There is no change with him nor anything like it. The immutability or unchangeability of God is an attribute that God is unchanging in his character. He's unchanging in his commitment, and he's unchanging in his covenant. Now let's look at these three capacities tonight. Three capacities where God proves changeless. First of all, God's immutability is clearly seen in his character. Amen. Our text says, for I am the Lord, Malachi 3, 6, I change not. Now the Hebrew word for Lord here is Yahweh, which is the self-revealed name of the God of the Old Testament. It comes from the Hebrew verb to be, or it means at its core. God is at its core, at his core, changeless. It's a part of his character. Yahweh means to be. The English Bible translated as Lord, which distinguishes from uh, lowercase l, -O -L, l, lowercase o-r-d, which is translated as master. This Lord, as written in Malachi here, speaks about his core or his character. What's at his core? He's changeless. He's changeless. Jesus said unto the Jews in John 8, 58, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, not I was, I am. In other words, I've always been. Before Abraham was, I am. I am. I've always been. Amen. Certainly so with God. He is unchanging. God's immutability is seen in his character, his, his, his actuality or his essential being. It's part of his core. It's what he is. He is the changeless one. Psalms 102, verse number 24, speaks of this capacity where God proves changeless. In Psalms 102, and verse number 24, it says, I said, oh, my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations. Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same and thy years shall have no end. The psalmist here contrasted the changing destiny of the heavens and earth with God's changelessness. Verse 26 says, They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Or one rendering says, But you remain forever. Goes on to say, You will change them. But it says in verse 27, But thou art the same. Why? Because God does not change. Number two, in addition to his character, God's immutability is seen in his commitment. Throughout the book of Malachi, we read about commitments. Let's read a few couple of them here. In Malachi, the first chapter, 
Malachi 1 and 6 says, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is mine honor? And if I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priest, that despise my name. And ye say, Wherein have we despised thy name? Here we speak about a commitments or some commitments that a father has to his son. Or son to his father, rather. Servants to, the mas to, to his master. And then we read in the third, second chapter, I'm sorry, second chapter, verse number 15, it says, And did not he, he make one, yet had he, speaking about the uh, commitment in a marriage, certainly has got a spiritual application. But let's just look at the literal for a moment. This union that God brings a man and woman together in the holy matrimony of marriage, or that we call marriage, Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and, and wherefore one, Malachi 2 and 15, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away, or one rendering says, I hate divorce. It's speaking about a relationship. And I know many in this congregation have been affected. Either they've been through or maybe a parent. And I'm sure you would all agree that is a very hurtful thing. But this message should comfort every one of us. Because God is faithful to his commitments. God is changeless concerning his commitments. Those commitments he makes to us, he's going to fulfill that. He's going he's to uh, follow through. It says here, that uh, in verse number 16, therefore take heed to your spirit, let none deal treacherously. Uh, in verse number 16, he said, he hateth, excuse me, he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore take heed to your spirit, that ye deal not treacherously or unfaithfully. Let me read this to you out of another rendering. Didn't the Lord make you one with your wife in body and spirit? You are, you are his. And what does he want? Godly children from your union. Isn't that good? Yeah. This is right out of Malachi, the New Living Translation. Godly children from your union. So guard your heart. Amen. Parents, this is good admonition to every one of us tonight. God wants godly children from our marriage union. And the way to have that is to guard your heart. For the wise men said, guard your heart. For out of it are the issues of life. Above all else, we must guard our heart. And then he goes on to say in this rendering, remain loyal to the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. The, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So guard your heart. Do not be unfaithful to your wife. Isn't that good? If every man and woman could hear this tonight, could sit under the gospel, wouldn't that change homes? If husband and wife, I know it would. My home has been changed. Your home has been changed. I'm certain I've been affected in a, in, a, in a good way. You sit under the gospel, it changes your heart. And it'll change the fruit of the heart and, and what you do. Now, what about God's commitment to his people? Well, in our text it says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, it's an adverb. Or for that reason, expressing his commitment, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Or another rendering says, that's why you haven't been wiped out. Why? Because I'm committed to my promise. Well, let's look into this just a moment. Because God's eternal purpose stands good and his gifts and callings are without repentance, the Israelites were indeed chastised, chastened and corrected, but not wholly consumed. They had a place in a nation. The great promise made to their forefathers would also be fulfilled in due time. He calls them the sons of Jacob to remind them of the covenant made with their great ancestor, which was the portion of all true Israelites. While God's mercy can be exhausted, God is committed to saving those who meet the conditions set forth in his word. God is committed to seeing souls saved. And if you don't think he is, let me give you a verse here and let you chew on it for just a moment. 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Well, I just don't understand why God's not bringing an end to all this evil and just 
bringing in time, reeling time into eternity and wiping us all out. You're not God. You don't understand what he has in mind totally or what his thoughts are. Much higher than our thoughts. His ways much higher than our ways. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Or one rendering says, but is extraordinarily patient towards you. God is extraordinarily patient towards every one of us because he's faithful to his commitment. He wants to work with us. He wants to see us not only saved, come unto a knowledge of truth, but he wants to see us make it to heaven someday. We're not just taken to heaven the day we were saved. Many of us, most of us, were certainly those who are here tonight. We were saved for a reason. Not only, of course, to keep us from hell, but also to save others and to impact the lives of others and to make a difference in this society, this society to be a light. Amen. To shine the light of the gospel in the sin-darkened world. He goes on to say, Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is certainly, his mercy can be exhausted, but he's committed to saving those who meet the Bible conditions. 1 Timothy 2 and 4 says, Who will have all men? What is God's universal will for mankind? To be saved. To be saved. And to come unto the knowledge of the truth. God wants us to be saved and then sit under a pastor, Jeremiah 3.15, where we can come to a knowledge. Where we can gain knowledge and understanding by sitting under the ministry, but also reading, praying, worshiping, being active in a local congregation. God's commitment to mankind and his will for us is just as immutable as his word. Because it's part of the sacred canon of scripture. And the Bible says in Psalms 119.89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Another rendering says standing firm and unchangeable. Don't try to tell me that God's word needs to be changed. It needs to be updated. Modern English or, you know, we need to change some of the gender ideas and change this and change that. No! Psalms 119.89 says, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Another rendering says that it's firmly fixed, or that it's rather that it's standing firm and unchangeable. Thirdly, in addition to his character and his commitment, God's immutability is seen in his covenant. Let's look at Malachi 3, our scripture text, just ahead of our text, the onset of that chapter, Malachi 3, many times in the second chapter, but let's grab one verse in the third chapter. It says, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. The Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. The term covenant is of Latin origin. It means a coming together. It presupposes two or more. It presupposes two or more parties who come together to make a contract, agreeing on promises, stipulations, privileges, and responsibilities. We read in our text of one of God's covenants: "For I am the Lord; I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed." God had made a covenant or promise to Jacob. If we go back to Genesis 22 and 18. Genesis 22 and 18, God's promise to Jacob. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Parents, never underestimate the value of your obedience. Here God said, I'm not going to destroy him because of Jacob. Let me read it to you again. Malachi 3 and 6. It says in our scripture text, For I am the Lord, I have changed not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob... Ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Genesis 22 and 18, we read of that promise to Jacob, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. You may have a wayward child, but you stay obedient. God may be protecting them because of your obedience. Think about that wayward son that drinks, that's on drugs. At any moment... He could be taken out into eternity. He could be involved in a DUI. 
as some sort of horrible, fatal accident? Why is it that God has spared him from doing that? Could it be because of your obedience? See, parents, it makes a difference how we live. God's looking, and he's concerned about his covenant with you, with all of us, with each of us. He certainly was with Jacob here in our text. God's immutability is seen in his covenant promises, uh, and his promises bring great hope. Look at Hebrews, the sixth chapter. As we read about God's covenants, God's promises, his agreements with humanity and with his people, it brings us great hope. And Hebrews, the sixth chapter, Hebrews 6 and 17 says, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to shew under the hair of the promise, the immutability of his counsel, the unchanging of his counsel, speaking about his covenant here, his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that which, that within the veil. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made a high priest after, uh, forever after the order of Melchizedek. God's promises are unchanging and trustworthy because God is unchanging and trustworthy. When you read in God's eternal word, you can grab a hold of that. If he says to you and he brings this right to your heart and he burdens your heart with no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly and he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Hold on to that. Amen. Amen. Has he laid that on your heart yet? To you single folks out there, well, start praying that way. God may lay that on your heart. And if he does, hold on to it. Because that's God's word. And God's word does not change. Amen. Our hope is secure and immovable, anchored in God, just as a ship's anchor holds firmly to the seabed. To the true seeker who comes to God and belief, God gives an unconditional promise of acceptance. Certainly, there's a condition that we must obey his voice and his word, but he's going to accept us. He's going to take us in if we meet the conditions. When you ask God with openness, honesty, and sincerity to save you from your sins, he'll do it. This truth should give you encouragement, assurance, and confidence tonight. Now, in our scripture text, the prophet actually references the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, specifically Numbers 23 and 19. Let's read that verse. Numbers 23 and verse number 19 clearly presents the immutability of God. It says, God is not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Or one rendering says, has he ever promised and not carried it through? The answer is no. What God promises, he's going to carry through. Now some may look at this and wonder, well, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 15, 29, we can read of Samuel's sorrowful words to Saul, and also the strength of Israel will not lie or, nor repent. For he is not a man that he should repent. Yet we can read in God's word that there were times when he did repent. And some may say, well, that's a contradiction. No, you've got to study God's word. The immutability of God is related to his omniscience. When someone changes their mind, it is often because new information has come to light, right? You maybe you're getting more information. That was not previously known or because the circumstances have changed and require a different attitude or action. Because God is omniscient, he cannot learn something new that he did not already know. So when the Bible speaks of God changing his mind, it must be understood that the circumstances or situation has changed, not God. When we read about God repenting, several passages read and speak about this, or at least a couple here I have in my notes here, speak of God changing his mind. It is simply describing a change of dispensation or outward dealings towards man. We read about this, we talked about Jonah last in our last study. And Jonah 3 and 10, it says this, And God saw their works. 
that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil. Well, God changes. No, no, no. God didn't change. They changed. Let me read it to you again. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. So God's mercy, or his wrath rather, turned to mercy. Of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. In other words... When they met the conditions, God stepped in and had compassion on them and changed the punishment he had pronounced on them. He changed it from mer- to mercy and acceptance. We can understand that, can't we? It's when we change, then the outcome becomes different. Lamentations 3 and 22 says, It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. God's immutability describes him as changeless, and he does not change in his essential being. He does not change in his attributes. He does not change in the principles by which he operates. God always acts on two principles. Either he rewards obedience, or he's going to punish disobedience. And he acts on those principles. When man shifts from obedience to disobedience, God must still be true to his own character by shifting from the first principle to the second. This seems like repentance to us, and it is so described in what we might call the language of human appearance, but it does not indicate regret or changeableness. God is always the same. In fact, we can read that God's name indicates so. Isaiah 37, 16 Isaiah 37, 16 says, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God. Thou art the God. Or one rendering says, the same. You're the God that's always the same. God's immutability is comforting because we know what he is, or who he is rather, and what he expects of us. In education, one of the hardest, difficult, most difficult tasks in education is something we call classroom management. For young teachers especially, this is probably the hardest lesson they have to learn. And I know I've been there. Classroom management. The ability to walk in and command the attention of your classroom and create order rather than chaos. That's very difficult. I went and observed a teacher about a week ago, a young teacher. I was there the whole day writing detailed observation about him. And his seventh seventh grade band was a disaster. (laughs) Classroom management. But part of classroom management is having clear expectations. If you don't set forth post rules, Post your expectation. They're clear, concise, not 16 different rules. And parents, this is good for us too. Some parents are like, well, you broke the 74th rule part B. A three-year-old does, can't manage all that. Just keep it simple. Listen, obey. All right, I can, I can do that. I can do that. But you keep it simple. But in the classroom, same thing. Keep it simple. Be in your seats when the bell rings, instruments out three minutes later, and here we play, or whatever it may be. But... If you're going to get those students to understand expectations and, and be in order, you got to have clear expectations. you got to be able to, to, to manage your classroom. And that's one of the hardest things. You take, uh, well, just uh, take anyone off the street and, you know, oh, teaching's a piece of cake. Well, stick them in a classroom all day long with a bunch of live wires and let's see, see how much cake it is. I think there's been ones over the years lose their job because they couldn't handle classroom management. It's like they went nuts and they, you know, pounded the table or threw chairs or tried to tie kids to a seat because they're live wires, right? Up and down and in and out. Well, you create an order in your classroom by having clear, clean expectations. And so it is with God. One key to have expectations clear to communicate to your students is you create them or you post them in verbal and nonverbal ways. But... I was thinking about this with God because his immutability creates order in our society. 
doesn't change. Every one of us knows what it's expected of us. Every one of us knows what God, expected, uh, what God expects of us. And to an extent, certainly the word of God presents it, but to an extent, it, to an extent the expectations are a little bit different between us because we're at different stages in our walk with God. What God expects of a newborn babe is a little bit different than what he expects of a seasoned saint. He doesn't have the knowledge. He doesn't have the understanding, right? But that's a comfort to know that you can be a day, uh, saved just a day, and then we can have another brother saved 30 years, and you're just as accepting with God because God is immutable. He never changes. His expectations are very clear, and we can know what he expects of us. God's immutability is a quality, a characteristic for us to imitate. We should be stable. Just as God is stable, he's constant, he's consistent, he's steadfast, we should try to emulate that in our Christian walk. If we are vacillating thickly and, and mercurial, or we represent to the world that you can be in and out and up and down in your walk with God and be just, and be just doing fine, that's painting a picture that the Bible doesn't portray. Every one of us should desire to be just as stable as God is. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, unmovable always abound in the work of God, uh, the work of the Lord, rather, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul said, be ye steadfast. Who? The brethren. He's speaking to the church of God at Corinth. He said, you... Be steadfast, unmovable to abound in the work of God or to succeed in the work of God. You must learn how to live this way, steadfast and unmovable. Sometimes we become apathetic about the serving the Lord because we don't see the results that we're after. And that's a, that, that, that's a danger in our walk with God. The Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, for in you shall reap if you faint not. There's a weariness that comes along this way. You've traveled and you've served God for 30, 40, 50 years, and you want this and this and this done. There's a weariness that comes about that and can be discouraging. We must not let discouragement over an apparent lack of results keep us from doing the work of the Lord enthusiastically as we have opportunity. I might add that our text appears in the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi, just prior to 434 years of no public message. Right during a time of great change, God said, I'm the Lord. I change not. We're living in a time of great change, and we're actually cautioned. I'm going to bring this right down to our everyday lives here just for a moment. In Proverbs, the 24th chapter, we're living in a time of great change, and we're cautioned not to meddle with them that are given to change. Did you know that? Proverbs 24 and 21. Let me read you a couple of verses. Proverbs 24 and 21. It says, My son, fear thou the Lord and the king, and meddle not with them that are given to change. For their calamity shall rise suddenly, and who knoweth the ruin of them both? Paul told us evil communications corrupt good manners. Those who are given to change, their spirit will affect you. What do you mean? They're married one day, they're divorced the next. They got pink hair one day, they got blue the next. Their skirt's down to the floor and it's up past their knees the next. They're here, they're there. They're on vacation, they're home from vacation. Got to go there, got to go there. They're in, they're out, they're up and down, they're at church one week. Out. Don't meddle with them. Yes, Amen. Show them love. Tell them you miss them. But don't spend hours and hours and hours in their company. The Bible says, meddle not with them that are given to change. There's a spirit that's, that uh, it takes an individual to where they can't even control themselves. Right. Think about the world we live in. You see individuals almost like you don't recognize them because they've changed their look. And they've changed this. And they've changed that. Right. Saint of God isn't that way. A saint of God is constant, firm, 
steadfast, unmovable. And I'm telling you, saints of God, there's a beauty to that. There's a beauty to that. I don't believe you age as quickly when you go God's way. Listen, they still think I'm a high schooler sometimes. <laughs> believe it or not. It's not too many years ago I was in the lunch line and I got yelled at by the lady until I turned around. Oh, that's Mr. Stegmire. Well, and I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm just saying, you live godly. There's something to be said about that. You, you live wholesomely. Living, living on the bottle, smoking like a chimney, tattooed all over your face and all over the place. It ages you. It changes you. It changes you from what God intended that you be. God intended you look that way. God intended you have that birthmark. Now, if it's cancerous or something, you may have to have it removed. I know they're worried about it. I got a big old birthmark on my back. Well, God put that there. It's called a birthmark. It was there at birth. Again, I'm not finding fault. If you have to have it removed, that's up to you and the Lord. But my point being is, God made you that way. God made you that way. Meddle not with them that are given to change. Let me give you another thought for consideration. When Jesus addressed all the congregations in Asia Minor, to each of the seven congregations, he presented himself to the need of the hour. And if you go to the Laodicean age, the time and period, it, it uh, corresponds to about 1930 to the consummation, the time in, in which we now live. The way in which J Jesus presented himself to the church of the Laodiceans was as the changeless one. And I haven't time to give you all the references, but to each of those seven churches, he presented himself to the need of the hour. I'm here to tell you tonight that the need of the hour is we're serving a changeless one. How many of you been with, talked to, even those in the religious realm who changed their ideas about God, changed where they worship, changed how they look, changed the requirements? God doesn't change. We can read. Let me give you a verse. Revelation 3, 14. Now he presented himself to the church to the church of the Laodiceans in this manner. Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write. This is Revelation 3, 14. These, saith, uh, these things saith the amen. In other words, it's, I've said it, that's it. It's settled. That's right. It's over. I'm done. I don't stop. I, I, or I don't change. Amen. We say that when we conclude a prayer, right? I'm through. He said the amen. The faithful and true witness. I don't change. I'm constant. I'm continual. I'm faithful. I'm true. The beginning of the creation of God. In other words, I've, I'm, I'm what I've always been since the very beginning, even before. Amen. Jesus presented himself to our age as the changeless one. If you study Laodicea, that word means justice or judgment of the people. Or literally the judgment of the people. Rather than the balance, the scales of the judgment of judgment being in the hands of God, they began to be placed in the hands of people, and people decided what God requires. How many churches out here have so many boards, you get splinters walking through their buildings, that'll say it should be this way. Well, no, we've revised that, and now it should be this way. Well, no, we're not going to accept that anymore. Oh, we're going to allow this into the priesthood now. The Bible doesn't change. And I'm telling you, saints, it's comfort to know that God's word does not change. He created two genders. There will always and only be two genders. That's all there will ever be. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, it's very beautiful. It's beautiful. It is perfect. It completes what we call marriage. It completes. Amen. God did all that. There's no need to change it. I like that old song, I don't want to change it, I want to rearrange it. I love it just like it is. Christ and his word. In other words, Jesus was basically telling the church of the Laodiceans, I and my word have not changed. Why have you? Huh? 
I haven't changed. Why have you? But how many today have changed? Well, I know they used to teach that. Or they used to walk that way. They used to dress that way. But that's old fuddy-duddy and old-fashioned. God hasn't changed. He's always required modesty, and he will always require modesty. And it's for your blessing and benefit, and it's for the good of the other party as well. It's for your protection, it's for the protection of the other party as well. And God will not change on that. Amen. Our text says, John, I'm just a little further. God does not change. I change not. The Bible says that God doesn't change. In Hebrews 13 and 8, we read where Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Jesus Christ does not change. We can bring this closer to our individual lives. In Hebrews 13 and 5, it says, Let your, conver let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We have the changeless one living within us. We should not change. That's all in that chapter. <coughs> Hebrews 13 and, 9 and 8. Jesus Christ is saying yesterday and today and forever. Back up to the fifth verse. Let your conversation, or the Greek I believe says conduct, be with, or it's your whole manner of living be without covetousness. In other words, be content with what you have. Because you don't need to change. Well, I've got to have this. I've got to have a new car. I've got to have a new home. Gotta, well, sometimes there are upgrades necessary. But not always. Sometimes God says just be content with what you have. And what's most important is he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. We're living in a more enlightened day than anyone in history. And yet we see more churchgoers today who want to dress, act, and live more like the world than ever before. There are many more false professions today than any time in history of our world. There is more changing going on in churches today, yet all claiming to serve the same immutable God. My question is, who has changed? Who has changed? In closing, my text says, For I am the Lord, I change not. I do not change. The three capacities where God proves changeless are His character, His commitment, and His covenant. What about our character and commitment to His covenant tonight? I want to ask us some questions here, and then I'm going to be through. Sister Lauren likes to see this. So there it is. I'm almost through. What about our character and our commitment to his covenant? Are we unchanging? Are we fixed? Are we set, unyielding, unbending, permanent, established, unshakable, unvarying? These are all synonyms of immutability. Established, permanent, unbending, unshakable, unvarying, constant, lasting, abiding, enduring, persistent, and perpetual. And our walk with God, does that describe us? Oh, yes, that's me. Check, 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 check. Or, let's get the anonyms here. Are we changeable, varying, shifting, fluctuating, irregular? How about irregular in our church attendance? We can't be that way and truly live as God would have us to live. Because he's constant. And God desires that we be steadfast. Immovable, fluctuating, or let me go back there. Yes, yeah, shifting, fluctuating, irregular, wavering, vacillating, inconsistent, floating, unsteady, unstable, unsettled, moved, unfixed, temperamental. Well, that's a good one. Temperamental, fickle, unpredictable, undependable, unreliable, up and down. That's, that's what this, when I was studying, that's what, it, that's what they offer. That's pretty good. One, up and down. Some people's experiences are that way. God doesn't want us to be up and down. Now, we deal with problems all the time. I had dealt with some major problem, a major problem on Monday. That doesn't mean I'm giving up on God and throwing in the towel. That's just a drop in the bucket in this greater scheme of life. That's just a little happening. In fact, I asked my classes today. I, I said I'm transparent with my kids, and I am. I told them the story today in class. Our class had been to the ER. What in the world? Well, it just seems like it's a kind of a growing up experience. Let me ask this big congregation tonight. How many of you have been to the ER? Look at all those many times over here. Look at all those hands go up. Well, see, we've experienced this, right? So you know what I'm talking about. It's, it, it, what they call a waiting room really is a waiting room. You wait, and you wait, and you wait some more. <laughs> Amen. I guess you got to, like, be gushing blood out of your head or something before they zoom you back. But anyways, 
Maybe Sister Katie can tell us the secret to all that. How do you get back there quicker? All right, I'm just teasing you. Anyways, this antonym, another antonym is unsettled, movable, unfixed, temperamental, fickle, unpredictable, undependable, unreliable, up and down, and blowing hot and cold. That's pretty good, blowing hot and cold. Well, some people are that way. I love the Lord. I don't want to go to church. Hot and cold. Amen. Psalms 112, verse number 5, says this. Psalms 112, it says, A good man sheweth favor and lendeth. He will guide his affairs with discretion. It goes on to say, Surely he shall not be moved. He shall not be moved forever. Isn't that good? Psalms 112, 5 through 7. Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. His heart is fixed. Trusting in the Lord. That's God's desire for every one of our lives tonight. Is to not be moved because our heart is fixed trusting in the Lord. The Bible says in Micah 6 and 8, He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with thy God. And these requirements are just as immutable as God is. We don't have to guess what's expected of us tonight. God's word bears it out, and it's up to us to obey it. To do, to love, to walk. To do what? Do what's right. Do what's right. You do what's right. You be merciful. You walk humbly. And God will make you a stable saint. He'll make you someone that's immovable. We don't have to guess what's expected of us. God's word bears it out. It's up to us to obey it. I ask us, and I'm through, how is your character and commitment to his covenant? How is your character and your commitment to his covenant? What do you mean his covenant? His promises, his word. His word. Are you just as unbending, immovable as God's eternal word that's forever settled in heaven? God is able to establish every one of us by the word of God, by the watering of the priest's word of God, by prayer, by faithful church attendance. He's able to establish us so we can be just as unchanging as he is, just as fixed as he is. We need to be determined, every one of us, that no, I'm not going to do that. See, one of the things that God's attitude doesn't change towards, he doesn't change his attitude towards sin. Sin's always separated from God since the very beginning, and that doesn't change. God doesn't just suddenly accept sin or sinful lifestyles. He doesn't accept it. He's light. He doesn't fellowship darkness at all. There's no darkness in him. Amen. We must, must be just as settled that we're going to stay away from sin by the grace of God. Shall we stand? Shall we sing? Thank you for listening. Appreciate your good attention. Let's turn to page 213 in the Church of God hymnal.
like that last that last part of the chorus. I cannot live without him, nor without him dare not die. You know, it's scary knowing that there's people out in the world that do not have God, and there's a possibility of them passing away without meeting God. You know, I thought I often think about our brothers. Um, oh, their names are Brother Bablo and Brother Naylor. You know, they were in service just like this, not knowing that they were leaving eternity just hours later. You know, we never know when we're going to be leaving, but we better have God with us before we leave. Often we throw sin towards heaven before we go. That way it can be weighed. But as, if it follows, that's the scary part. We're thankful for this wonderful series Brother Reggie's preaching on. It's awesome, awesome series. Let's go praying for our pastor. He's in extreme pain tonight, so let's go praying for him. The Bible says he's worthy of a double portion of honor. So let's go praying for him. We're going to ask uh, Brother Ronnie to dismiss us in prayer. Brother Ronnie.